Hi, this is Corey Franklin with Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. This is uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Famous words there, and tonight we're going to discuss the man who issued them and an even more famous phrase, probably the most famous phrase that will ever come out of the 20th century. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Of course, that was Neil Armstrong, and those were the first words spoken by the first man who walked on the moon on July 20th, 1969. 500 years from now, if there are history books, I don't know if they'll record the names of Mao or Stalin or Hitler or Picasso or Charlie Chaplin, but if there are history books, they will record the name of Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong died recently at the age of 82. He was the commander of Apollo 11, and by being the first man to walk on the moon, he fulfilled the dream of countless people over countless eons. He sort of muffed that quote there, it's supposed to be one small step for a man. He claimed for a while that he did say a, and some computer analysts have said that there is an a buried in there you can't hear, but I guess if you're the first guy to walk on the moon, there's a lot of pressure on you and there's no do-over, so you're allowed a little bit of a boo-boo. What was it like to walk on the moon? Well, let's hear Armstrong describe to 600 million people as he was walking on the lunar surface. Um, uh, at the foot of the ladder, they planted the American flag on the lunar surface with a plaque. The plaque was written by William Safire, by the way, who was Richard Nixon's speechwriter, one of the best wordsmiths in the United States. Ironically, he said 1969 A.D., and the correct term is A.D. 1969, so William Safire gets credit for committing the first typographic error in space. For those who haven't uh, read the plaque, uh, we'll read the plaque. It's on the front landing gear of this lamp. While Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were out there doing this, poor Michael Collins was inside the module and couldn't see it. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. That's right, I don't mind a bit. William Sapphire was also charged with writing a speech in case Apollo 11 did not fulfill its mission. And of course, if it didn't fulfill its mission, it would have meant that three astronauts would have died in space. But if you followed Neil Armstrong's career from his birth, you realize he was resourceful, brilliant, fearless guy, and that was unlikely to happen. Neil Armstrong was born in Wapakoneta, Ohio, at the height of the Depression. Wapakoneta is only about 50 or 60 miles from Dayton, Ohio, and Dayton, Ohio is where the Wright brothers were from. So there's a history of flight in that area. And the Wright brothers were Neil Armstrong's heroes when he was growing up, along with Charles Lindbergh. He got the flight bug when he was young. And before he had his driver's license, he had learned to fly and got his pilot's license. And he used to putter around with some friends trying to put together old airplane engines. He went to Purdue University to get an engineering degree because he had an engineering bent. But while he was at Purdue, he was called to service in the Korean War. He used his flying experience and flew fighter jets. He flew 78 missions. And he was a war hero. He went back to Purdue to complete his engineering degree. And then he went to fly for the military. He flew the rocket-powered X-15. He flew with the greatest pilot of all, Chuck Yeager, who tells a funny story about a young Neil Armstrong almost losing a plane the first time that Chuck Yeager flew with him. Went over to NASA, and they had a T-33, and Neil was flying it, so I took my chute over and my helmet, light flying suit and gloves. And I got in the back seat and sat there, and Neil taxis out and takes off on the dry lake bed, and we fly up to Smith's Ranch Lake, and he backs off, comes in, he's going to, Touched down. I said, Neil, there, the lake is wet. He said, oh, I think it looks dry enough for me to just touch down and let it roll and I'll add power and then 
come back off. You get on that leg surface in a T33 and it starts sinking in, you're never going to overcome the drag with the power up here at about 5,000 feet elevation where the lake bed is. And that's exactly what happened. He came in, touched down, man, the airplane starts slowing down. He puts full power on it and it keeps slowing down. Finally, it just stops and sinks in the mud. And we're sitting there, now what? We're 30 miles from the road. It's 3.30 in the afternoon and it's cold. You've got 30 miles to walk with thin flying suit on. And fortunately, Paul Bickle, sent a, C, a Goonie Bird, a C-47 at NASA down up to follow us because he suspected something might happen. He just good insurance. We sat there for about a half an hour and just sitting on the wing of the airplane, and you could walk on this the lake bed with lead, lead footprints. Pretty soon, the old Goonie Bird hove into sight. So I got back in the airplane, got the battery switch on, turned the radio on, and told the guy, I said, we only got one choice. If you land over next to the edge of the lake and keep the airplane rolling, you probably will won't sink and then we can get back off the ground i said give us time to walk over to the edge of the lake don't slow the airplane down you just keep the door we'll jump aboard he did he landed and slowed it down again he was a good rut in the lake but he kept power on as he came by we ran along and jumped in the back end of the airplane and we come back to edwards it was after dark the t-33 you set up there in the navy went out and recovered it week later you know you know things because you live on those lake beds like i had since 1945 guys you know they don't use their head good story about a young neil armstrong when the russians launched sputnik in 1957 which we talked about when we talked about bernard lovell recently the pilots who flew with chut yeager became the first astronauts they were the mercury astronauts neil armstrong was a little younger than them he was the generation behind them and he heard this famous speech by John Kennedy in 1961. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Predicting you would land a man on the moon before 1970 was pretty radical stuff at that time. And Neil Armstrong joined the astronaut program the next year in 1962 and became part of the Gemini program. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to ABC's Frank Reynolds. Reynolds was ABC's top correspondent at the time. And when Apollo 11 was launched before it landed on the moon, Reynolds described Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong actually could fly a plane and was licensed to fly a plane before the state of Ohio legally authorized him to drive a car on his 16th birthday, I believe it was, when he got his uh, pilot's license. And, of course, the most important flight of his career will take place this Sunday when he lands that lunar module on the moon and becomes the first man to walk on the moon. All the astronauts are experienced men, experienced at their line of work, you might say. None more so, really, than Neil Armstrong. He can fly just about anything that has wings. And his flight record is a long jumble of numbers and letters like the F-104, the B-47, paraglider, the F-5D, and many others. When he was a boy in Wapakoneta, Ohio, he and a friend repaired a wrecked plane, and Neil actually learned to fly it. During those late 30s and early 40s, he developed a love of flying that he has never lost. Armstrong left the small plane class in 1949, however... When, after a couple of years at school at Purdue, he became a pilot in the United States Navy. He flew 78 combat missions during the Korean War, and in 1955, he became a test pilot for NASA's high-speed flight station at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And there he continued to add to his flight record that now shows he's had more than 4,000 hours flying time. In September of 1962, Neil Armstrong became an astronaut, he served as backup command pilot for Gemini 5 and then command pilot for the Gemini 8 mission. Armstrong was a low-key guy, and he never panicked. And when there was a mishap during the Gemini program, Armstrong was cool under pressure. He was the first man to successfully dock two vehicles in space, but more importantly, he showed his coolness under fire. A malfunction caused the dock vehicles to pitch about wildly. Armstrong separated the Agena from the Gemini spacecraft, but the spinning uh, continued for him and for Dave Scott. Just seconds away from disaster, Armstrong found the cause of the spinning and stabilized the Gemini spacecraft. It was not the first nor the last demonstration by Neil Armstrong of his magnificent control of himself and whatever flying machine he happens to be piloting. Now he is in command 
of man's most historic flight to date. I think the Gemini episode probably convinced NASA that he would be the right person to land on the moon first. Buzz Aldrin sort of lobbied for it, but Neil Armstrong was low-key and never lobbied, and I think NASA liked that also. Robert Klein had a great remark. He said, Neil Armstrong's greatness is in the fact that he didn't step on the moon and say Coca-Cola or anything like that. After the Apollo 11 mission, Neil Armstrong never went up in space again. He never promoted the fact that he was the first person to walk on the moon. He gave very few interviews. In fact, one of the only significant interviews he ever gave was to the BBC a year after the Apollo 11 mission, where he described what it was like to walk on the moon. Mr. Armstrong, yes, that when you were on the moon, you had very little time for gazing upwards. But could you tell us something about what the sky actually looks like from the moon, the sun, the earth, the stars, if any, and so on? The sky is uh, a deep black when viewed from the moon, as it is when viewed from uh, cislunar space, the space between the earth and the moon. The earth is the only visible object other than the sun that can be seen, although there have been some reports of seeing planets. I myself did not see planets from the surface, but I suspect they might uh, be visible. The Earth is quite beautiful from space, uh, so, and, and from the moon, it looks quite small and quite remote. It's very blue and covered with uh, white lace and uh, the clouds. The continents are clearly seen, although they have very little color from that distance. What about the sun? Do you see any trace of the corona? No, the uh, glare from the sun on the helmet visor was too difficult to pick out the corona. The only time we could see the corona was during an eclipse of the sun from the moon, that is, when we were flying through the moon's shadow and could observe the solar corona peeking out from behind the moon. Looking at the photographs that you brought back, it seems that the color of the surface actually varies according to the angle from which you see it. Is this so? Yes, it certainly does. Uh, it's a characteristic that we observe first traveling around the moon in orbit. You can see that at the terminator, the boundary between the black part of the moon and the lighted part of the moon, it was as if you were looking at a television set with the contrast turned full contrast, very black and very white. As you moved uh, further into the light, there were more and more shades of gray. But as you moved further, such the sun was higher above the horizon, you actually start to see the uh, tans and browns appear, although uh, at a very low level. Similarly, on the surface of the moon, the same characteristic is evident. You can see uh, browns if the sun is high enough. Apollo 12, for example, landed while the sun was only five degrees above the horizon. So when they arrived, they saw no browns or tans anywhere, only fairly high contrast grays. Yes, I did. The sun was 11 degrees. And Apollo 12 did also the next day when, the, uh, when they arose from their sleeping period and the sun was higher. Of course, then the browns were observable to them. When you were actually walking about on the moon's surface and kicking about a certain amount of dust, did you notice any local color? And also, were you at all subconsciously worried about the possibility of unsafe areas? Color is a, is a puzzling phenomenon on the, on the moon, aside from the characteristics that I've already mentioned. Uh, you generally have the impression of being on a desert-like surface with rather light-colored hues, yet when you look at the material at close range, as if in your hand, you find it's a charcoal gray, in fact, and we were never able to find any things that were very different from that color. Uh, I suspect that as we get more and more samples with future flights, we will see that there is, in fact, some color, but the optical properties on the moon are most peculiar. I think I heard you say once that uh, near afar things looked quite near. Yes, we had uh, uh, some difficulties in perception of, of distance. For example, our television camera, we judged to be from the cockpit of the lunar module only about uh, 50 to 60 feet away, yet we knew that we had pulled it out extension of a 100-foot cable. Similarly, we had difficulty uh, guessing how far the hills out on the horizon might be. A peculiar phenomena is the closeness of the horizon due to the yeah. greater curvature of the moon than we have here on Earth, of course, four times greater. It is an irregular surface with crater rims overlying other crater rims. Uh, you, you can't see the real horizon. You're seeing hills that are somewhat closer to you. There was a large crater, uh, which we overflew during our final approach, which was it had hills of the order of 100 feet in height. We were only 
11, 1200 feet west of that hill, and we couldn't see a 100 foot high hill from 11 to 1200 feet away. So Did you notice any obvious difference between the far side and the near side? No observable distant, uh, differences in color, but sun's angle was always somewhat different over there, so it would be difficult to make a uh, general correlation. Mm -hmm. I would say the topography is the striking change. Yeah, yeah. Of course, as uh, all your viewers mm -hmm. know, there are no seas on the far <laughs> side of the moon. and It's, uh, it's all uh, highlands and uh, high mountains, big craters, so uh, it's strikingly different from the... Do you think, from your knowledge of the moon, having been there, that it is going to be possible in the foreseeable future to set up scientific bases there on anything like a large scale? Oh, I'm quite certain that we'll have such bases uh, in our lifetime, somewhat like the Antarctic stations uh, and similar scientific outposts, continually manned. Certainly there's the problem of the environment, the vacuum, and the high and low temperatures of day and night. Still in all, in many ways, it's more hospitable than Antarctica might be. Uh, there are no storms, no snow, no high winds, no unpredictable weather uh, phenomena that we're yet aware of, and the gravity is a very pleasant kind of place to work in, better than here on Earth, and uh, I think it would be quite, quite a pleasant place to do scientific work and quite practical. Mr. Armstrong, thank you very much, and again, let me say what a tremendous honor and privilege it's been to have you with us. Thank you. There you have what the moon was like by one of the 12 people who can say it firsthand. Brilliant guy, not so good with his predictions predicted we'd have space stations on the moon. Before he died, he actually criticized the government for abandoning the whole space station concept of manned flight. But it was quite rare for Neil Armstrong to go public with any opinion like that. You know, one of the biggest American heroes was John Glenn, who was one of the Mercury astronauts. First American to orbit the Earth, and then he became a senator, and then he went back up into space. And John Glenn once said that the only person that he was jealous of was Neil Armstrong. A lot of the astronauts, by the way, were jealous of Neil Armstrong. But he uh, never held it over anybody, and as I said, he never tried to cash in on his good fortune, as some of the astronauts actually did. Some of them actually brought back tchotchkes they had taken with them to the moon and tried to sell them later on, which was against NASA policy. Neil Armstrong never did any of that stuff. He never got in any trouble for that. Here's John Glenn talking about Neil Armstrong. You know, Neil had a lot of close escapes, that he was, uh, but he was dedicated to flying and so on. He had to bail out once in Korea uh, after his plane was hit and uh, was damaged. Uh, he had to bail out of a, a trainer at Houston that was a training for the lunar landing. And then the actual landing on the moon was they were uh, down to the, he was down to the last, I think they estimated between 15 and 35 seconds of fuel when they actually sat down on the moon. So that was a, a very close one also. So uh, he was dedicated to what he was doing and I'm always remembering, I think, uh, what I said earlier here, that he he was willing to dare great for his country and he was proud to do that and yet remained the same uh, humble person he'd always been. His humility indeed was one of his greatest assets. After he left NASA, he had plenty of offers, but he went back to the University of Cincinnati, back to his home state of Ohio, and talked for a while in the aerospace division. A couple years back, the 60 Minutes guys tried to get him to blow his own horn. Sometimes they like to do that. And they said, well, you know, you're one of only 12 guys who's walked on the moon, and you were the first guy, and isn't that a big deal? And here's how he answered him. And with Neil Armstrong, you knew it wasn't false humility. No, I just don't deserve it. Yeah, I wasn't chosen to be first. I was just chosen to command that flight. Circumstance put me in that particular role. That wasn't planned by anyone. I guess we all like to be recognized not for one piece of fireworks, but for the ledger of our daily work. In this world where modesty seems to go on out of fashion, we could all learn something from Neil Armstrong's attitude. A great man and a modest hero. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. And as a final tribute to Neil Armstrong, of course, you have to have a song about the moon. I decided to use one of my favorites by one of my favorite singers, one of the greatest singers ever. It's That Old Devil Moon by Judy Garland. With a final word tossed in there by Neil Armstrong. Commander Armstrong, we all thank you. I look at you and suddenly Something in your eyes I see Soon begins bewitching me In my own view, the important achievement of, of Apollo was a demonstration that 
humanity is not forever chained to this planet.